Good morning. In the name of Jesus Christ, we welcome you to First Presbyterian Church of Monroe, Michigan. And happy Valentine's Day. Today we, is a day we celebrate love. We appreciate the love of friends and neighbors and family. But most of all, we are grateful for God's unconditional and unfailing love. Let's pass this love along, especially this week, to Jean and Gary, to all who are sick or suffering in any way, or someone that just needs a little bit of tender care. Let us seek to simplify this moment, slow down for a time. Let us worship, leaning on prayer, reflection, and music. Let us worship God who is holding our hands and lives. The psalm that comes at the end of our series speaks of an active God whose light shines for all time and in all places. God is not silent, but calls the people to remember that they too can act on God's behalf, holding all suffering peoples in hands of prayer and care and transforming the world that will shine bright into the future. May it be so. This last week, we will sing all the verses of our theme song. God is holding your life. God. 
Please join me in prayer. Holy One, light of the world, you help us to see and find our way in this time. Open us this day to a vision of the world made all right, so that we might alight our own lives to show, faith, to show forth your reign on earth as it is in heaven. We praise you for your steadfast presence holding our lives together in love. Amen. Now let's sing hymn number 314, Christ Be Our Light.
Today's reading is from Psalms, Psalm number 50, verses 1 through 6. Adonai, our God, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Adonai comes and won't be silent. A devouring fire goes before God while storms rage all around. God summons heaven and earth to the trial of God's people. Gather to me my faithful ones who make their covenant with me by sacrifice. The, sev the heavens affirm God's justice because it is God who is the judge. Selah, the word of our Lord. Friends, Psalm 50 says that God is on the way to visit. Yeah, God is coming. <laughs> should we be uh, should we be scared? Can, can we be excited? Well, according to the psalmist, it is time to be very excited. This is a wonderful thing because God is coming with justice. From where the sun rises to where it goes down at night, God's voice is going out to the sky and to the earth that God is coming with justice, fairness for everyone. This psalm might ask us to think about our lives and what is it like when justice is present, when we are embodying God's goodness, God's fairness for everyone. This song is called, The One is Shining Forth. And the name for God here is The One, which I learned from Van Morrison.
Well, here we are at the end of seven weeks in the Psalms, the Psalms being the liturgy of worship for the people of Israel. Let us go back and reflect. First, we've learned that all lives are precious. God calls us to a just society. Next, live in awe and wonder. God's presence is all around us, in ourselves, in others, and in all the created world. And then, where can we go apart from God's presence? The answer is nowhere. Although we can choose to ignore God or celebrate God. And then the one constant in our lives, God alone. And then shout out a whole heart, hallelujah, for God's miracles are all around us. Then last week, we reflected on waiting, hoping, and staying focused on our Creator. And now today we hear God's light shines for all time and in all places. Open your eyes. All of us need to open our eyes and see the vision that God presents to us. Get excited. God is coming with justice, fairness for all. Now, I expect that some of you were a little nervous about parts of this psalm reading this morning. Because the psalm makes clear that a glorious experience of divine presence is not an end in itself, but is for the purpose for both judgment and renewal. I suspect we're excited about the renewal part and we're a little cautious even nervous about the judgment part. Divine self-disclosure always has the character of a gift of grace. A particularly ex intense experience of the presence of God is not something that can be conjured or cajoled or manipulated or otherwise brought about. It simply requires our presence and God's gift. And so in this liturgy of the Psalms, we learn that prayer and worship are responses to God by which we orient ourselves to what matters, to what is ultimately of worth. In worship, we open ourselves to being shaped in conformity with God's truth and shaped by the ground and the source of our being. Actually, and this may come as a shock to some, we don't worship to get something out of it. It's not what worship is about. But in order that our lives may be more fully in accord with the purposes and intentions of God, more fully in accord with the deepest desires of our hearts to be in relationship with God, 
and to more fully manifest the person we were created to be. If we always thought about worship in that way, we might interact a little differently in planning worship services or communicating those things that we liked or more likely didn't like in a particular service. It's not about getting something. It's about being inspired again to be in the presence of God. And the startling part for some of us is that the purpose of this call of God is to exercise judgment. That's a word we don't like very much, I know. There are those sayings in the Bible like, judge not, lest you be judged. And here we speak of God coming to judge us. If we have any sense at all, our knees ought to be shaking, and we ought to be running over in our mind, oh, What is God going to say when God notices me? Well, let's remember that judgment is not necessarily about fear or doom. I judge you, you've done something wrong, you're going to jail, you're losing your freedom, you're giving up whatever. That's not always what judgment is about and certainly not by God. Judgment is the occasion when God brings hope in the form of a renewed commitment. Let me say that again. Judgment can also be the occasion that God brings hope in the form of renewed commitment to what really matters in life. So, perhaps an alternative to that sort of cringing response to judgment for us as people of faith is to trust, to trust in the love of God and the promise that God's desire is that we be in relationship with God, with each other, that we know salvation, and that we truly live. As we trust God for life, we can face anything, including the consequences of our own behavior. And we do understand, all of us, at some level, that our behavior has consequences, and rightly so. The psalm holds that worship without ethical transformation is worthless. That's not what we're here for and is not a real encounter with God. It's maybe a nice moment that we share together, but if transformation is not happening, we have been wasting our time, and perhaps God's as well. A visit to God's sanctuary should orient us to God's judgment. We should go home convinced about how life ought to be lived and focused on practicing justice, fairness, mercy, graciousness, and steadfast discipleship. To live as God's people means to make a commitment to ethics and to discipleship. In biblical language, we might say to fear God, 
And we know that word shows up a lot, particularly in the Old Testament, but not exclusively there. And so a lot of people talk about the God of the Old Testament as being cruel and fear, and we should be fearful. And yet, to fear God is in fact to embrace integrity in our relationships. Think about that. To fear God is to embrace integrity in relationships with God and with each other. Because God is calling on the faithful not for blessing, but for accountability. That's an idea that some have lost sight of, but God has not. And Jesus has not. Today's the day in which we celebrate the transfiguration of Jesus up on a mountaintop with Peter and James and John. And all of a sudden, Jesus becomes glowing white, and there is a bright illumination all around him. And the story continues, and at the end of it, or the story continues, and Moses appears, and Elijah appears. Moses, the bringer of the laws, and Elijah, representing the prophets. And finally, as Peter, as Peter does, is trying to figure out, what should we do now? Maybe we should build tents for each one and all of that. And in the midst of all of that uncertainty by humans, there is a voice through the clouds saying, this is my son. And in that moment, We understand that what is being communicated is that Jesus is, in fact, the Son of God. Although at the end of the text, he will tell them not to tell anybody, because there are things that are coming, which we know are coming, arrest and trial and execution and resurrection. What we need to remember about Jesus is his his devotion to the reign of God on earth. And that this devotion by Jesus always provokes the powers that be. The earthly powers, the fear, the hatred, the greed, the falsehoods, the violence, and the despair that pervade and literally distort everything human. Jesus stands against them. Understanding that this stance will cause these powers to kill him. Jesus died because the powers of evil the powers of humans who felt they were more important than God because that power sought to destroy his witness. And what is his witness? Nonviolent love, endless compassion, listening, listening to understand, not necessarily to respond, justice, and truth. Jesus comes to be God on earth so that we humans could actually see him and perhaps understand. Jesus has passion. He is not the quiet guy who sort of strolls along He's excited. 
He wants to meet people. He wants to get out. He wants to share the good news. Jesus is not that image that we have reduced him to. He is a radical who is standing up for the value of every single human being and indeed all of creation. So what does this mean for us? Well, I think it means that if we want to follow Jesus, who was on earth to articulate for human beings who God is, then we need to be vigorous and assertive in our pursuit of justice, both social justice and personal righteousness. And how do we do that? We do that through a love, a compassion, which refuses to play the world's power games. We are not about domination, exploitation, greed, or deception. A follower of Jesus does not live in any of those places. The transfiguration story is a call to affirm the ultimate truth of this radical and contrary claim of God and to begin to live with all our heart and our soul, all our strength and all our mind in the confidence that Jesus' nonviolent way is truly and unequivocally the way of salvation, healing, and eternal life. The knowledge of Jesus as the divine son comes as a revelation in God's time and in God's way. It's a gift. God gives it freely. God gives Jesus to us freely. It's not something we can take possession of and control so that we can claim some spiritual or religious or institutional status or personal power as if we have somehow become little gods ourselves by ruling in his name. Jesus' mission was not to make a big deal of himself or to elevate his followers to positions of power, authority, or prestige through identification with him. That is not why he came. Although in the past 2,000 years, a lot of people have thought it was. Jesus' mission was rather to point to and through and beyond himself to God and to God's coming reign on earth and to invite his followers to find their voice in bearing witness to this transformative, redemptive God. I would like to close with a prayer that I just received this morning from a fascinating woman, Nadia Bowles Weber, who is a unconventional, shall we say, Lutheran pastor. What I like about her is that she's very direct in her communication, and she just puts things out there in a very real way. So let us pray Nadia's prayer this morning. Dear God, this morning when I took my first sip of coffee and said, 
thank you out loud to seemingly nobody, I wondered if I'd finally gone mad. But then I realized I was talking to you, God. And suddenly, I was not just grateful for the coffee, but even more so for that moment of respite from my standard negativity. Now I am feeling more greedy for more. So selfishly, I am now going to indulge in a short list of things I am grateful for in this moment, because it feels like a button of relief from the pain of self-obsession. I am thankful for a working furnace in the sub-zero temperatures. For whomever is plowing, whoever is driving the snowplow outside my window. For the dog or cat on my lap. For the food in my belly. For the heart inside my chest that keeps giving and receiving love, I give you thanks. For my houseplant that is still alive and for the tap water that still runs clean, and for this body that still moves freely, I give you thanks. Lord, help me remember that gratitude is a free antidepressant that you provide as a factory-installed standard feature, and that it is a gift that you have given us not one, we give you. Thank you for creating us with a capacity for praise. I can't imagine how miserable and annoying we'd be without it. And the people said, Amen. Okay, before we go to offering this morning, we have a couple announcements. Um, session has called the annual congregational meeting for February 28th. That will be immediately after service. And the second announcement is we will begin worshiping in person on Ash Wednesday. Um, there's a, several new protocols that we're going to try and follow to try and keep everyone from contact, contracting COVID. So please read these in the email that you received, and we hope that you stay well. Now, please join me in prayer. Loving Father, thank you that you are our strength and our song. You fill our hearts with joy. May we give our offerings to you with gladness and joy. Everything we have belongs to you, 
and we rejoice to give some of your abundant gifts back to you. Bless the tithes and offerings we give today. Let the majesty of the Father be the light that guides us. The compassion of the Son be the love that inspires us. And the presence of the Holy Spirit be the power that propels us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us have one more Selah moment together to end this series. However, we hope that you will continue to find and create these intentional pauses for yourself in your days, remembering to acknowledge the loving God who is holding your life. We will hear the bell and then have some silence. Feel free to close your eyes and if you like, imagine yourself held in safety and love and care. When you hear the sound again, open your eyes. It is now time for the prayers of the people. I invite you to write your prayer concerns on pieces of paper as we have been doing for the past seven weeks, placing them in some kind of container or bowl or a little jar, a symbolic action as if you were placing them in God's hands and into God's care. I invite you now to place your hands on your container for a final blessing of all of the prayers that you have written over these seven weeks. Let us pray. Holy and living God, Jesus, friend, spirit of love and care, we commend to you these prayers, these cares. We know already You are working, holding our lives in every way. Help us all to know your steadfast presence and to be a steadfast presence to others in need. Amen. If this practice of writing prayers and then putting them in a container has been meaningful to you, we would encourage you to continue to keep your container in a place that's special to you. Or an alternative might be to give that container to someone else and encourage them to develop this practice as well. Let the people say, Selah. Let us continue our prayers. As a prayer posture for this worship series, I invite you to cup your hands, ready to receive God's love and peace, and in preparation to be God's love and peace in the world. Let us pray for the leaders of this world, this country, and this church community. Help us to find ways to act responsibly and to be willing to hold each other accountable for the actions that we have done which have caused harm, intentional or not. God of justice, hear our prayer. Let us pray for those who live in conflict around the world, 
who fear for their safety daily as armies troop through, who wonder if their home will be safe, if their children will be safe, if they will even see them today. Prince of Peace, hear our prayer. Let us pray for all who are experiencing loss of any kind in this pandemic, whether their health, their life, or simply being with the ones that they hold most dear. And we pray also for those who are working to heal, most particularly Jean and Gary. Comforting healer, hear our prayer. Let us pray for those who are homeless, hungry, alone, wondering about their very existence. Emmanuel, God with us, hear our prayer. Let us pray for those like us who live in comfort, that we may exhibit a Christ-like hospitality and generosity to those around us in our community and around the world. Transforming spirit, hear our prayer. Holy and living one, for those we have named, for those whose names are written on our hearts, and for those whose names we do not know, we lift them to you. You know their needs. Hear our prayer. Now we are bold to pray the prayer Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Abba, Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Okay, now it's time for passing the peace. Will you make a gesture of extending your cup hands toward others who may be with you and near you as a sign of offering the peace that Christ gives us? If you're alone, please cup your hands over your heart as a sign that you send your heartfelt peace out to the world. The peace of Christ be with you. Friends, go now in the knowledge that God is holding your life even as we hold each other. You are not alone. You are loved. Indeed, you are beloved of God. Amen. <laughs> 